So UFC 310 just took place, and overall I think that it was a pretty decent card. There was some very good fights on there, and then there was also a couple of fights that I would consider not so entertaining. But overall, I think that it was a pretty good pay-per-view. It was pretty stacked on paper, and I do think that for the most part it, it did deliver quite a bit. Now 14 fights, it is a lot to get through, but I feel like even though the card took place over the period of what, like 7 hours? It still kind of felt like it flew by relatively quickly, so I think that was pretty good overall. Now, of course, I am still in a pretty new setup. I did move house. I have a new microphone set up at the moment. I know my lighting is terrible, but it is so hot right now. I've got the window open and also the curtains open just so I can stay relatively cool. Let me know what you think of the microphone setup as well. I did just turn the volume down on the mic, or I guess I, I turned it down... I don't really know what to call it. I pretty much turned the mic down <laughs> is what I did. And um, yeah, let's get into it. I want to make it relatively quick because I do have work in less than 11 hours and my alarm is set for about 9 hours from now as I'm recording at 7 p.m. So I really wouldn't mind uh, getting about 8 hours of sleep before the work week does begin. Now, Kennedy and Jukwuku fought against Lucas Burski in the first uh, first fight of the night. Heavyweight matchup. And Kennedy and Jukuku does it again. He gets another late finish in the first round by knockout. And he looked good, man. Like, he was defending a lot of Lucas Burski's shots. He was a lot faster than Burski, so he was able to get out of the way on defense. And then eventually, he did catch him with a big right hook. And then he did finish him in the end of the round. Unfortunately for Burski, this is probably the end of the road for him. But as for Kennedy and Jukuku and any light heavyweight on the roster right now, that is pretty big. Just come to this weight class, come to heavyweight, man, and I'm kind of like thinking about the opposite. Junior Tafa, do not come down to light heavyweight. Stay at heavyweight, mate, trust me. And then Chase Super fought against Clay Guida. Overall, quite a lot of grappling sequences did lead to the armbar. Chase Super, though, did look pretty good, did throw up a lot of grappling sequences. A lot of people were comparing it to like a Charles Oliveira type performance, which was pretty cool. Ended up getting an armbar, which you don't see every day either. And eventually did beat Clay Guida towards the end of the first round as well. For Clay Guida, he didn't retire. He probably is just going to keep going. I mean, why not? Uh, I mean, I don't mind seeing Clay Guida fight. It doesn't really look like he is kind of at a point right now where he just can't beat anyone. So I think that there probably still are a couple of fights out there for Guida where he can be pretty competitive. But for Chase Hooper, another big performance for him. It does just continue to look like he is making pretty big improvements. And I wouldn't mind seeing Chase Hooper get just a little bit of a step up in competition for the next one. Maybe like someone like Esteban Redovic could be quite fun, but maybe also very dangerous. Now, Michael Chiesa just fought against Max Griffin. Uh, this is like the first fight that I got wrong on the card, and oh me, oh my, did I get this fight incorrect. It was just not a good prediction at all, was it, fellas? Oh, uh, I did pick Max Griffin in this matchup. Now, I could cope and just say, oh, you know, I picked an underdog, this and that, and they didn't win. This was a bad pick. It just was a bad pick. Michael Chiesa on the feet didn't even look that out um, classed, even though the commentary were constantly saying how bad Chiesa's striking is, which is hilarious because they work with him. Um, <laughs> Chiesa's striking didn't actually look terrible, which is probably the biggest surprise of the entire night, actually. But he was getting takedowns against Griffin. It seems like he wants to fight in Seattle, but he doesn't know if he can make the quick turnaround. Nonetheless, uh, although I'm not really a big Chiesa fan, I will openly admit that, he is still like a pretty likeable personality, and he did end up getting the choke against Griffin. Just overall a pretty dominant performance, Max Griffin didn't really do anything, I will be honest. In fact, he even attempted a couple of takedowns, which is just a really bad idea. Now, Joshua Van beat up Cody Durden pretty badly. Now, I am willing to put myself on a hill on this one here, but I did think that Cody Durden won the first round. But then Joshua Van really started to take over. It looked like Cody Durden just kind of used all of his energy in the first round. And just once again, another underdog pick. That didn't work out. Joshua Van being 23 years old is kind of crazy because he is just really, really good for this weight class. The thing about Josh Van, though, that we do still see is that he is just tiny. He's just tiny for the weight class. This guy would be a straw weight if there was a men's straw weight division in the UFC. But Cody Durden, I thought he started pretty strong. But then he gassed himself out by getting takedowns. And I don't know what has happened to Durden. Like, maybe it's just age or something's happened to him. Because this is a guy that I think he attempted, like, 14 takedowns. He's got, like, one of the, the takedown records for takedown attempts at flyweight. 
and we've seen him push pretty hard. He's We've seen him push that pace for 15 minutes before, mm -hmm. so something's up with Duradin. I don't know what it is, but Josh Van, just for the most part, was just beating the crap out of him on the feet. The round two, Duradin had nothing left, and Van was just piecing him up. I think one of the judges gave him a TN8 round for round two. I don't know if he did enough to get a TN8. I'm sorry, I just hit my microphone stand, but... He was just beating him up, and it was the body shots that was the answer. That's one thing that Joshua Van does so well, is he rips the body in with his boxing, and that is just something that we don't see enough in MMA, because if you do rip the body, it gives a lot of good advantages. Like, if you rip the body, your hands, before you bring them back, are already pretty low, so you can defend a takedown if, if someone's going to try and counter you like that, which he did use a couple of times. But yeah, Duran just gassed out Van, just beat him up on the feet. Now Van's going to be ranked. I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing Van versus, like, Matt Schnell. That would be kind of fun. Or even, like, I know he's coming off a loss. But, like, Joshua Van versus Azat Maksam, I think, would also be pretty fun, too. Now we have Eric Anders. He beat up Chris Weidman. A little bit of controversy, I guess, because he did hit Chris Weidman with an illegal knee. But I think it was just genuinely like a misunderstanding of the rules because the rule set has recently changed on what's a grounded opponent and what's not. Eric Anders probably thought that Weidman was grounded with the new rule set and he wasn't. Is what it is. Hopefully they can just make it all grounded and he's going to be legal in the future because that would have helped out our boy Kaya Sakura. But anyway, um, Eric Anders, I thought for the most part looked good. Chris Weidman... I thought he just looked really bad. Um, I did pick Anders as well. I mean, he closed it as an underdog apparently, so that's a pretty good underdog pick. But yeah, Weidman just, he just can't get takedowns anymore, man. I don't know what's happened to him. He couldn't take down Bruno Silva, um, even though he was trying to gouge his eyes out the whole fight. He couldn't take down Brad Tavares. Eric Anders, just a good performance overall. Um, hurt Weidman early in the first and then in the second round. I think he landed. Someone said it was 100 unanswered ground and pound shots. Someone let me know if that's true, uh, but there was a lot of ground and pound before it was stopped, and it was stopped arguably early for the situation that it was. No, no, it was stopped arguably early, but because of the situation that it was, because Anders had just already, like, probably taken, like, a lot of time off, like, Chris Weidman's life, um, the ref just stood up as soon as Eric Anders pretty much postured up, and I was about to start doing some really serious damage to Chris Weidman, and he's not the only one. That probably got CTE from this card, and we'll be talking about Anthony Smith in a moment. But before we do that, let's talk about Battle versus Brown. Split decision. Seems to be controversial. I did think that Randy Brown won the fight. I actually thought that this was a really good performance for... No, I take it back. It was a good performance for Randy Brown, but it was a really bad performance for Brian Battle. Like, Brian Battle looked so bad. People are saying online in the Discord and on Twitter as well that his performance against Kevin Ducey could have been an outlier. Like, that's how bad Brian Battle looked in this fight. And, um, I don't know, maybe it's just kind of too early to tell about that, but Brian Battle did miss weight by four pounds. That didn't actually discourage me from, from picking or changing my pick or anything, because Brian Battle did look fine. And Randy Brown even called him out on it, saying like, oh, hey, I made the big weight cut, you didn't. And if you do look at him on the scale, it doesn't actually look like he was drained. Like, it didn't look like he tried to really, really make that 170-pound mark. So, hey, it is what it is. But battle, yeah, just kind of a bad performance for him. He missed weight a lot. Seems like he didn't win. Uh, it's probably fine. I'm going to have to watch back again, even though I really don't want to, because it wasn't that entertaining. Yeah, battle just, he just didn't look that good. But he got the nod. He got the decision. Tried to make it back on the mic, but he just made things worse for him. Battle probably lost a lot of fans tonight, I think. And now Moza Evloev fights against Aljamain Sterling. It's a Moza Evloev classic. He did the same thing against Arnold Allen. The exact same thing against Arnold Allen. So he goes out there, and he loses the first round, and he just looks really bad in the first round. Like, I was watching Moza Evloev fight in the first, and I was like, wow. Moza, like, he's just not that good, is he? And then he goes out there in the second round, and Sterling is gassed. Like, he's not super, super gassed, but he is gassed. And then they, and he wins the second round pretty clearly, I thought. And then they go out into the third round. And the same sort of thing happens where Moza was able to go out there. And I thought that he did enough to win the fight. Now, it's actually a close one, because you could argue that Sterling did more damage in the third round. But I somewhat disagree like I think if anything the damage was dead even and when the damage is dead even that's when you start to score other things like effective grappling 
and I thought that Ivaluev had the more effective grappling in the third round. He had the more moments as well, I thought, in the third round. Like, throughout, he was just kind of landing those little little chippy shots, I guess you would call them, like close range punches and, and elbows and stuff like that on Aljo. Had top control a little bit. But Aljamain Sterling, much better performance than I expected. I thought he looked a lot better than I expected him to look like, so I will put my hand up and say I underestimated him in the fight. But at the end of the day, although some people think that Sterling won that fight, I don't think you can give Sterling two rounds. You can't give him the second round. There's not a world where he won the second round. And the third round, I thought that Evloev did win it because I thought he did the more effective grappling, even though the damage itself was pretty pretty close but let me know what you think about that one i would say though the sterling like in the first round kind of had me worried he was out wrestling evloev and i said it in my breakdown the way that sterling wins this fight like if sterling has any chance to win this fight he needs to out wrestle moves evloev and i said there is no way that happens and i was wrong i was very wrong sterling out wrestled him quite a lot in the first round actually and then even in some moments got a big slam in the third which i think some people are trying to score for damage and it is true it is a damaging shot but i do think that evloev overall especially towards the end was kind of just landing a bit at the end so close fight for evloev one thing i will say about this no title shot no title shot for you mate uh diego lopez weighed in as the backup for Ilya versus holloway and uh the performance was like kind of boring like it is an aljamain sterling fight so it's always going to be boring but it was kind of boring and then on top of that like some people think that he lost and it just like wasn't really that great it wasn't like a let's get the title shot now i think give the title shot to diego lopez diego lopez waited as the backup or we'll just do the rematch but then who's Ilya going to fight like we're just going to find the ryzen featherweight champion to fight Ilya tapuria who knows Vicente Luque's back. I picked Vicente Luque. Um, only closed plus 125, which is interesting. He was a bigger underdog at one point. He's back. I did try my best to fade the poor striking defense of Timber Garimbo, and it worked out in the end. Now, the way that it worked out was Vicente Luque just landed like three punches, like in close of Timber, and it, I don't know if it actually dropped Timber because he kind of fell forward and then into a takedown attempt. So it's kind of hard to tell if he actually like almost like flash KO'd him on the feed or dropped him, like genuinely put him out a little bit. But then the the legend comes back. The Das Knight returns. The Das Knight is back. He got the Das choke on Garindo, put him out cold with the Das. And um, I did actually say that I think that Luke wins by KO, but he could win by sub and it could be by Das. I didn't actually pick Luke by sub. I actually picked Luke by KO. Because, as I said, I was trying to fade the poor striking defense of Garimbo. But, hey, I mean, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. I kind of need it because a couple of my other picks were a bit poor. Now we have Dominic Reyes fighting against Anthony Smith. And this is kind of like the moment where I think that you guys might learn there is, there is something, there's something not really right with me. Um... And I feel, I feel bad admitting it, but I don't really know how else to say it, but other than, like, I, I don't feel empathy the same way that other people do, and, like, this is something that was diagnosed, um, as a child for me, um, and when I saw Anthony Smith walking out and crying, I, uh, deposited uh, to my gambling account, obviously, and then I put it all on Dominic Reyes to win, and bet him to win by KO, so that happened, and that's what happened, Dominic Reyes won by KO, Anthony Smith for like the first 30 seconds just wasn't there, and then he started to look pretty good, I will say, towards the end of the first round, but then in the second round, uh, Reyes catches him a couple times, gets him in like some control, and just ground and pounds him for, I want to say, like two minutes straight, and Anthony Smith is just holding onto his leg while, like, literally losing years off his life. Like, I don't know if Anthony Smith has kids, but I really hope that they weren't watching this fight. Actually, they were. They were because they walked out with him. Oh, no, that's just the worst. That's the worst. Um, yeah, nonetheless, um, Anthony Smith's children just watched him lose, like, multiple years off his life. And if Anthony Smith didn't have CTE before this fight... He definitely does now. Dominic Reyes did a lot of damage to Anthony Smith. Like, a lot of damage to Anthony Smith. It was quite sad to see. Now, one thing that was not sad to see. It was sad for me, because I did pick Nate Landwehr. But it wasn't sad to see the Korean Superboy come back, man. He looked so, so good. Now, I didn't really just base my pick off of... Um, 
I did. I did. I, 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 I was lying to you guys. I based my pick entirely on this fight just being an all-out war. And I thought that the guy that had a little bit more left in the tank was going to be Nate the Train. And the thing about Duho Choi is he has looked good recently in his return after his military service and his injury. But he hasn't looked amazing. He hasn't looked incredible. And I was trying to fade him a little bit. And another thing about the guys that train under the Korean Zombie... They all fight just like the Korean Zombie. Literally all of them, like Han Seol Kim versus Taiyaki Naraji is a fight that I recommend you watch. They just do, all of them do their best Korean Zombie impression where they come forward and they just try and throw down in the middle of the cage, which is like the best thing to watch, but it's not really the most effective way to win a fight without taking much damage. And I thought that the Korean Super, super Boy, the GOAT himself, was going to come out there and do that. And he didn't. And my goodness, did he look good. He looked really good, man. Like, he was out striking at the train everywhere on the feet. Nate Landwehr never really got started. Um, Like, Nate, the train got hurt early and then didn't make his great comeback like he always does. Duho Choi just kept hurting him. He hurt him multiple times in that first round. And then he also got takedowns as well. I did actually say in my breakdown that we have seen Duho Choi start to add a bit of wrestling to his game, but I didn't think it was going to be effective against Nate the Train. One thing I'll say about the Nate the Train is that this guy, like, he was the M1 champion. And he was, like, I believe the only American fighting for M1 Global at the time. Because, um, like, this is, like, I believe it's based in, like, Poland. I don't know if it's actually based in Russia, but... Kazakhstan, some of the fights were in, but nonetheless, he's fighting for M1 Challenge, which is, like, uh, from that area, and he was beating all of these guys, like, he was brought in to lose to all of these guys, and then he beat them all and become the cha champion, is literally the story of him at M1, and now he's been in the UFC since, and I was like, you know, I don't think he's going to get the takedowns on Nate the Train, I was wrong, he outgrappled grappled Nate, Nate Landwehr, he outstruck Nate Landwehr, he looked really good, he called out... Bryce Mitchell, I actually do love the call out, to be honest with you, I think I, I actually like it quite a lot, but another fight that I'd like to see is like Duho Choi versus Dan Ige, I honestly think that Dan Ige stylistically would be a bit of a tougher matchup for the Korean Superboy, just because Dan Ige is a really good boxer and wrestler, whereas Bryce Mitchell kind of is, like just a wrestler grappler for the most part, but yeah, Duho Choi honestly looked really good, I was quite impressed by him. Another fighter that, you know, I mean, Bryce Mitchell beat Crone Gracie. Um, it's just a Crone Gracie fight, isn't it? In the big 2024. He's 36. He just was pulling... The, th the thing about Crone Gracie was he was pulling guard and doing nothing with it. Like, he wasn't pulling guard and then trying to, like, throw up subs off his back, throw up elbows off his back. He was just pulling guard. Like, I just... I, I don't get it i don't understand it yes he did have an armbar in the second round but mitchell got out of it and then the third round happens he pulls guard again and bryce mitchell just kind of does the old forearm slam the old classic that um i think a lot of people posted a lot of those forearm slam highlights after he did it on twitter so there's quite a lot of them floating around right now but mitchell got the forearm slam and then just landed a couple massive elbows on him after that and knocked him out the fight was boring, the fight sucked, I mean, are you, the thing is about Bryce Mitchell, you can't actually blame Bryce Mitchell for it, because Crone Gracie was just pulling him down, and Mitchell's a wrestler, a grappler himself, and he probably wanted to sub Crone, he probably really did, but, yeah, Bryce Mitchell thought, um, another thing about it though, is I think that Bryce Mitchell did fight, like a smarter fight, then I personally expected him to fight because I actually thought that he was going to be initiating takedowns and just trying to grapple with Crone. And he kind of did, but he didn't at the same time. Uh, Crone Gracie, I really would like to see Crone Gracie versus Ryan Hall. Or, if he's still even in the promotion, Crone Gracie versus Herbert Burns. Please make it happen. Bryce Mitchell, I mean... Duho Choi called him out. I actually like that fight quite a bit, but other than that, there is some ranked options for him. Maybe like Giga Chikadze, since he's already beaten Edson Barboza. But Barboza's mm. fighting Steve Garcia, so who knows? Now, Cyril Garn beat Volkov. Did he really beat Volkov, though? And this is the question that I wish I could answer for you guys, because... I uh, will admit, uh, since I start work at 6 in the morning tomorrow... I uh, was trying to cook my dinner because I wanted to get to bed before like 10 p.m. Um, and I was cooking my dinner while this fight was on my laptop. Now, to be fair, my laptop was right there and I was cooking on the stove right in front of me. 
I didn't watch enough of the fight to make a very clear call, but it seems like a lot of people think that Volkov won. Some people are calling it the robbery of the year. Now, Jacob from We Want Picks thought that Garn was up 2-0 and just put like $400 on Garn in between rounds 2 and 3. So, you know, I do value his opponent opinion a bit. So this is a situation I'm just going to have to watch it again. I'm just going to put my hand up and say openly, I, I genuinely, I did watch the fight. I did watch the fight because I saw Cyril Garn just doing his silly stuff again, trying to get a leak lock. I think it was in the second round he did that. Tried to get Kamaras. I think it was in the third round he did that. Uh, seems pretty unanimous that Volkov won the first round, but it seems like relatively unanimous as well that Garn won the second round. So it comes down to the second round, I would say, and that's the round that I'm going to have to watch. So that's the situation for... No, 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 no. It seems pretty unanimous, sorry, that Garn won the first round and Volkov won the third round. I'm confusing myself and I'm confusing you. We're moving up to the co-main event. Shavkat Rakhmanov versus Ian Gary. It didn't go the way that I thought it was going to go. I thought that Shavkat was just going to absolutely dominate him in the grappling. And that didn't really happen, did it? Now, Shavkat, for the most part, in the first round, he was trying to get a takedown. And he was exerting quite a lot of energy to try and get the takedown. But Ian Gary was doing a very good job defending it. So... Shavkat from there just didn't really he backed off pretty much because I think he was like this is a five round fight I'm not just gonna try and gas myself out to get this fight down to the ground in the first and he's a good enough striker anyway that he can hang with Ian Gary and that's what he did so in the first he landed a couple big shots won the round I thought uh won the rounds against Ian Gary and then round two comes around Shavkat I thought he won it on the feet because he did shoot for takedowns but he didn't really get them again landed a couple big shots like it was pretty low volume as well at this point I should say Round three happens. It's pretty low volume again. I thought Ingari was the better striker there. I thought he landed more. And then the fight starts to get really good in round four and five. Because Shavkat then starts to get his takedowns in round four. He's starting to get control. It looks like he's going to be able to get some submissions. He starts working for an arm triangle. He starts working for re naked chokes. Fun round. I thought Shavkat uh, won the fourth. And then... Ian Gary comes out there in the first round, gets the back of Shavkat very early, but could not finish the rear naked choke because it's Shavkat Rakhmanov. And, you know, Ian Gary, like, not really well known to be a striker, but nearly got the choke on Shavkat, which was pretty big. And then they had a couple big scrambles. Shavkat himself tried to have some moments, but I thought Ian Gary won the fifth, but it was too little, too late. I thought Shavkat won three to two. I mean, all three judges gave it 48 47. I'm going to guess those scorecards as well. Ian Gary's grappling's good though, right? It's getting better. I thought it looked pretty bad in a couple of his previous fights and it's looking improving. And now training with Charles Oliveira would do that. So he looks pretty good. But um, yeah, that's kind of it. Shavkat won by decision. He's going to fight Bilal next. There really is no one else to give Bilal that I can think of just off of the top of my head right now. So I think it's pretty undisputed. Well, it is undisputed. Shavkat's going to get the fight. This should be for the interim title as well. I'll say that because Bilal couldn't fight Shavkat because of an injury. So it should have been for the interim belt. But I, I do digress. It is what it is. Um, Shavkat's the number one contender. He is fighting Bilal. Now, Pantoja versus Asakura happened, and um, Pantoja did get the sub. I think I picked Pantoja by sub in round two or three, so I was right on that one. Man, I really wish that the fight did last a bit longer, because this is like worst case scenario. I really wanted Kai Asakura to make a pretty like good performance, like a pretty good name for himself. And I think that he didn't have a bad performance, um, to be fair. I think that the stats in the first round were a little bit off. I didn't think that Pantoja was outlanding him that much. But at the start of the fight, it starts out crazy. These guys are flyweights. And it's Alejandro Pantoja, by the way. People don't like Pantoja. Pantoja is one of the most exciting fighters on the roster. And the fight starts out exciting. It starts out great, like like all Pantoja fights do. And um, Asakura lands a fly knee as Pantoja's getting a takedown. Asakura defends the takedown well. Pantoja then hurts him with, I believe it was a right hand. Even though it was up against the cage, he hurts him with the right hand. Uh, drops Asakura or like stumbles him off balance anyway and turns it into another takedown attempt but at the first round Asakura's takedown defense was like pretty good like it was actually quite elite I actually thought I was like man like this guy's takedown defense is actually like a lot better than I thought it was going to be but then the second round happens and then very early on into the second round Alejandro Pantoja he gets the back of Kai Asakura that's one thing he does so well he does it up against the cage he does it on the ground 
you you just can't really defend that from Pantoja. He just kind of is one of the best at doing that, and he chokes out Kai Sakura. Sad to see, Asakura didn't tap. It looked like actually for a moment he fought the hands quite well, but Pantoja had it locked in. He had the he had the the legs locked. I, for, I forgot I forgot what it's called, but he had the legs crossed. He had the body lock locked in. Um, he had it all going for himself, so Asakura couldn't get out. He didn't tap. He really went out kind of um without tapping. Damn. <laughs> I mean, listen. I'm happy that Pantoja won. I really like Pantoja, but I'm just a little bit sad that Isakura didn't really make a bit of a name for himself because now I just worry that the casual MMA fan base is just going to kind of completely discredit Kai Isakura and completely discredit this win for Pantoja because it was a very good win. Now, from here though, like, do you just do Pantoja versus Moreno 4? I, I just don't even know if you can sell that, man. Like, what, what are the rankings even looking like? At this point, I mean, I don't have the UFC rankings up, but I could just throw out the topology rankings. Oh, it's Amir Albaz. No, Amir Albaz got smoked by Miranda. What am I on about? Hold on. Hold on. What are the rankings even looking like? Is Kaikara France coming off a win? I mean, you dude. Brandon Royale is the number one contender and Pantoja's beaten him twice. And Brandon Moreno, Pantoja's beaten him three times. Albazi's coming off a loss. He's already beaten Kai Kara France. No, he hasn't. He hasn't beaten Kai Kara France. Is that the fight to do next? I think Kai Kara France is only on one fight. No, he has, hasn't he? He did. Yeah, he did. He has beaten Kai Kara France. This is the problem with Pantoja, man. He's just been too dull. I mean, can you justify a Kai Kara France title shot? I don't even know, man. That's the thing. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I will do my UFC uh, Florida card, UFC Tampa card tomorrow. I'm not really finished with the picks on that one. By the way, Duran versus Rebus 2, the first fight of the new year. Banger card. Banger card. Really looking forward to it. Covington versus Buckley is the last fight of the year, last card of the year. And then after that, I'm going to do like a lot of like my top 10, like KOs of the year, top 10 subs of the year, you know, top 10 fighters of the year, probably top five. I mean, 10's a lot. And then just do like a bit of an awards show sort of thing. And then I think I'm going to start talking about contender series for next year, like who I think should be on the show, fighters to watch out for on the show, if they're even going to be there. I don't know. I've got... Let me know some ideas. I'm going to make another video on the game WMMA5. That's the most popular video on my channel. I've been meaning to make a follow-up video on that one for about 18 months now. So that's a bit sad uh, for me. But yeah, Neverho Sterling is on the card, by the way, guys. Let's go. I'm excited for Neverho Sterling from New Zealand. I mean, Felipe Lima is on the card. This is a good card. This is a good card. I'm hyped for it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'll see you guys in the next one.